in the last couple of teaching, we have been looking at the question of the original sin. So we started looking at this tiny contentious concept called the original sin. The question we are asking ourselves is, how did the sin of Adam and the punishment and the fallout of their sin, how did it affect their progeny? How did it affect their offspring? How did it affect their descendant after them? How did the fall of Adam affect me? How did it affect you? And this concept of the original sin means that due to the sin of Adam, we are all born into the world with sinful nature. Due to the fall of Adam, we, you and I, every human that ever lived on the surface of this earth, even including all the patriarchs, even including all the men and women of faith that we have read in the scripture, because of the fall, because of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, every single human being that have ever walked the face of this earth was born into the world with sinful nature. We've been looking at some of the objection to this teaching. Some of the objection to this teaching. Some people object and say, you know what? Is this concept actually just? Is this concept actually biblical? How does this concept affect our Lord Jesus Christ? And isn't this concept based on a faulty interpretation of the book of Romans chapter 5 verse so we, we've been answering some of this some of this question isn't it so to help us kick off today let us look at again at two quotes that we look at in in the course of our last teaching so let's look at the quote from Calvin Calvin defines original sin as the hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature diffused into all parts of the soul which first make us liable to God's wrath, then also bring forth in us those works which the scripture calls the work of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Now let us also read from Henry Blusher's book, The Original Sin. The Christian doctrine of original sin is designed to deal with these threefold questions. It tries to account for sin as a universal phenomenon and yet a matter of personal responsibility. For is being natural in a sense, and yet contrary to our true nature. For is being there, even as we stand before God and under God. I decided to start with these two quotes because they bring into sharp focus what we have been dealing with. I'm not going to make any comment on those two quotes. If you want to, you can go back to the teaching the last time. So, we are, we've been looking up at this objection. So we are going to move this a little bit forward today. Very soon in our study, we will discover that only a few years after the catastrophic incident that we read in Genesis chapter 3, only a few years after that, Cain, the firstborn of Adam and Eve, will murder, will kill his brother Abel. Only a few years after this fall, and a few years later, we have this damning assessment about human from God that we read in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Where did all this start from? from the sin of Adam, from the fall of Adam. And we can see this cascade so naturally, if we can put it, even though it is unnatural because that is not the way God created human to be. We see that cascade into the life first of their first child, Cain killing Abel. And on and on it goes. And look around us today, the darkness, the evil, the wickedness, the sin, the rebellion, the chaos that we are surrounded with. And you can ask yourself that can humans sink any lower in sin and wickedness? Look around us. Even though we know that humans are capable of doing great heroism, but nevertheless, they have great capacity. We as humans have great capacity for doing evil. 
an idea safe for trying to cover the evil that we do. This is the way the Bible summarizes all of this for us. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Remember what we are doing? We are looking at this concept of original sin. That something happened in that Genesis chapter 3 that when Adam fell, something happened to Adam that is communicated to all his children after him. That due to the sin of Adam, we all are born into the world with this sinful nature. And we see that play out almost immediately, first in the life of Cain and also in the life of every single human being. Now, Romans chapter 3 verses 9 to 18 actually expanded it and fleshed this out for us. This propensity that we all have, you know, to sin, you know, because of the sinful nature that we have inherited from our forefathers. So let's read Romans chapter 3 and we are going to read verses 9 to 18. What then? Are we better than they know? In no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and and gentiles that they are all on the same as it is written wait for it there is none righteous this is god's commentary this is the conclusion there is none it is it is all encompassing the bible says there is none righteous no not one there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after god they are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Let's keep reading. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongue, they have used the seed. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and mystery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is God's commentary this is god's conclusion concerning human remember this is not the way god created us this is what happened when adam sinned we need to understand that that first sin changed the first man fundamentally that first sin changed adam fundamentally adam was created a living soul but when he sinned his nature experienced a titanic corruption is nature imploded as it were and it became that nature became a a sinful nature god created him to be a living soul but sin came and corrupted it and that nature became a sinful nature so adam went from being a living soul to a dead soul so adam's sin damaged his nature eternally damaged his nature irreparably and human nature was infected and corrupted by that original sin. That sin totally poisoned human nature. And it is this falling sinful nature that Adam then passed on to his children, that he passed on to his descendant, that is passed on to his progeny after him. And that includes every human that ever lived on the surface of this earth. That includes you and me. And by reason of the fall, by reason of this sinful nature, that then means that every human is born a sinner. We are not sinners because we sin. Rather, we sin because we are sinners. Now, remember the balance we are having here. We are still responsible for our individual sin. We are not sinners before because we sin. But we sin because we are sinners. This is the horror of the original sin that adam plunged the whole creation adam plunged the whole humanity into this darkness into this evil with that first sin you open this pandora's box you don't need to teach a newborn baby how to sin that baby already has that nature that predisposes him or her to sin and when the year of responsibility And when the year of accountability comes, that child, that beautiful (laughs) child, we sin naturally because he or she has inherited this sinful nature. And this is what essentially 
account for and explain the universality and the pervasiveness of sin. This is what explains it. Remember, this sinful nature is not human nature as God created it, but it is human nature as a fallen nature. And the fallen nature of human cannot but fall short of the glory of God. The fallen nature of human means that we cannot please God. The fallen nature of human means that we have a propensity to sin. And that is what accounts for the universality and the pervasiveness of sin. Philip E. Hughes in his book, The True Image, put it very succinctly, put it very clearly for us. So I'm going to read that for us. It's a quote from his book, The True Image by Philip Hughes. In biblical purview, not only do all the sins of mankind stem from that original sin of the first man, but the whole of mankind was involved in the commission of that first sin and therefore afflicted by its consequences. Consequences which flow from the perversion of man's true nature, so that now it is natural for him to be evil instead of good. Man's greatest need is to recover his true natural state. That statement is powerful. Our greatest need is to recover that truly natural state in the way that God created us to be before. Now, we can then ask ourselves, but what about our Lord Jesus Christ? When we say that the original sin means that Adam's sin and every human has been poisoned and corrupted by that original sin, then how will that have affected the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, it could have been affected if he was born as every human was born, but he wasn't. Now, this is very, very important. If the Lord Jesus Christ was born the same way that you and I were born, it would have been affected. His nature would have been corrupted by that original sin. He would have been born with a sinful nature. But he was not born like you and I were born. Let's read this in the book of Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to read quickly from verse 31 all the way down to 35. And behold, and this was the angel speaking to Mary. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angels, How shall this be seen? I know not a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the most of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called what? The Son of God. Now, this is the mystery of incarnation. This is the mystery of the virgin birth. And if you look at the detail of what we are talking about here, the Bible says that Mary will conceive in her womb. But Mary is not going to conceive by the same natural process that humans are conceived. And the angel told him that the process will be different. It will not be the process of a man and a woman coming together in sexual connection, in passionate sexual connection and giving birth and procreating. It's not going to be like that. The angel told Mary what this process is going to be. It's going to be by the Holy Ghost. That exactly the same way that God created Adam in the first time. Remember the way God did it. God came in and formed the body of Adam from the dust. And then God breathed. It was a two-way process. The body was formed and God breathed into it. You know that breath is rock and it is the word for wind. It is the same word for the Holy Spirit. The, the wind is one of the motif, one of the symbol of the Holy Spirit. And that is exactly what God is doing here. That God stepped in once again and God cre- re- created another body. But this time around, he didn't take that body from the soil. He created a new body in the womb of Mary. And that is why he didn't need the, the connection between Mary and Joseph. To create this body because this was God creating that body himself 
And then the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of God will overshadow you. And just like God created the body of Adam at the beginning and God breathed into that body, the breath of life, that same way God is doing the same thing with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ was the beginning of another creation. It was not a propagation of the whole creation. And this is very, very important. It was not propagating the life, the creation, that old creation that has now been corrupted. When the Lord Jesus Christ was born, it was a new creation. It was God stepping in once again to create. And this is very, very important. In the beginning, God created for six days and God rested. And human messed that creation up. Now, God has stood up once again to create and created the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. So that birth, that virgin birth was necessitated, okay, so that he would not be corrupted by the sinful nature of the first Adam. So the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ was the beginning of another creation, not the propagation of the whole creation. Even though you could trace the genealogy of Mary, even though you could tra trace the genealogy of Joseph and trace it all the way back, 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 back to Abraham, all the way back, back to Adam. But you need to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ was not a son of Adam, but he is rather the second Adam. He was born the last Adam. And just like the body of the first Adam was formed by God himself and he breathed into it the bread of life, that same way God fashioned the body. He fashioned a body for our Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. That was the beginning of a new creation. His body was not a product of a sexual union between Mary and Joseph. That would have made him the son of Adam and that would have made him to partake of the sinful nature. But that is the reason why he had to be born by a virgin Mary. Let's confirm that by reading scripture. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 45 to 47. And so it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, but the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. So here we see that he is not son of Adam. He is the second Adam. He is the last Adam. Praise the Lord. And we read in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5. It tells us that talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But what? A body as thou prepared for me. A body as thou prepared for me. God what God was doing in the virgin birth, that body has nothing to do with Mary. That body has nothing to do with Joseph. God fashioned that body in the womb of Mary. And it is yet remain like the body of every human. Okay, just like Adam's body was not born by any human. God fashioned it. But it is just like the body of his children after him. The same way, God fashioned the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary and it is yet still the body of human. So it is very, very important for us to understand that this is the reason for the virgin birth because the Lord Jesus Christ is the last Adam. He is the federal head of the new creation. He is the federal head just like the first Adam was the federal head of the old creation. The last Adam is the federal head of the new creation. He did not partake of the sinful nature of the first Adam because he was not born like any other human. And he was born the way he was born so that he is able to redeem human and then recover our true nature. And this is very, very important. He needed to be born human because he has to be our kinsman redeemer to be able to redeem us. But he cannot be born the same way we are born or else he will be tainted by the original sin and he will have inherited the sinful nature. So he has to be one of us, but at the same time, he has to be different from us. And that is the wisdom of God. He was born by 
a virgin birth. And the birth of the Savior signaled the beginning of the end of the old creation. It signaled the beginning of the new creation. And it also signaled the beginning of the end of the old creation. And that all is going to wrap, be wrap up at the end of the age. Now, we have moved far, far forward, almost like a quick journey, isn't it, through this story. So we will expand on this teaching. We are barely touching as we get on, you know, in this, our journey. Once we get to the respective junction where we need to emphasize each one of these teachings, we will emphasize it. But it is very, very important for you and I to understand that this is what is going on. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to stop here today by the grace of God. And we're going to pick it up here next time. There are still a couple of questions, a couple of, you know, um, objection that we need to look into with respect to this concept. But this is not a concept that we can sweep under the carpet. We cannot ignore it because it is inconvenient. We cannot ignore it because it is politically unacceptable. We cannot ignore it because of, you know, modern ideologies. So let's let, let just ignore it. No, we cannot. Because if we ignore it, then we totally will, will, will misunderstand the story. We misunderstand, you know, what God is doing in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are listening to me tonight and you are not born again, listen to me. There's no other name. You can see the reason why he had to come. The reason why he had to die is so that you and I can recover that which was lost in the Garden of Eden and that he can lift us, lift us up even to a higher level of communion with himself so that once again we can experience the nature of God and we can once again be called daughter and sons of God, children of God. We can be members of his household. We can be citizens of his kingdom and then we will escape the judgment that is going to fall on the children of disobedience. He has done it, but he can't force it on you. You have to accept it. So you have to come to him and accept that you are a sinner, number one. Accept that he's the savior, number two. Ask him to be your savior, number three. He will come in and save you. He will be your God, your father, your friend, your guide, your comforter. He will walk the rest of this world with you. And when this is all over, you will spend eternity with him in the new heaven and the new earth.